Hey everybody, welcome. This is real as we're getting, <laughs> as we're getting uh, with Karen the Mortician. So welcome to my channel. Um, working on rearranging the setup a little bit. So I'm getting a lot more sunlight than usual, which is nice, but you should really see my office right now. I literally took everything off and put it in a pile, forcing me to have to deal with it. And it's sat there now for... <clears throat> A week. <laughs> but uh, today I am supposed to be on the road filming. I had an epic, amazing day of filming planned. Um, yeah, the my my health got the best of me though. Had a little bit of a, another cold and yesterday was a busy day. Met two families yesterday. Um, bombed a posted body, which means they had an autopsy. And I think it just did me in. So I decided I needed just to chill at home with a stocking cap. I wear stocking caps a lot because I'm always cold. Um, so today, so welcome. First and foremost, I want to say if you guys have been to my channel, you have watched my beer with the boys. You have watched all of... Um, interactions with Brian and Ryan from undertaking the podcast. If you guys can just take a minute, send some prayers, thoughts, good, just caring love um, their way. Ryan's dad, who is a funeral director um, at a funeral home down in Indiana, has died this week. And so Ryan is on the other side of the table, as we say, other side of the desk where um it's kind of a struggle between being the funeral director and being the loved one of the person. And so just surrounding him with love this week and um, can't imagine what he's going through, but just be thinking about him and, and supporting him and your thoughts if you guys could. So here we go. Let's dive in for some of this. Um, this first question, I had been sent this a while ago and had lost my sheet. I try and print these out and keep them in a file when you guys send me questions to make sure I address them. And this one had gotten lost. And so we're coming back to it. Um, so from a viewer, thank you for being willing to share your knowledge with those of us interested. I contacted you... Um, a while back. And I will often say, if you try, if you put, put a message on YouTube, I'll tell you to email me because I'm not going to come back around to it on YouTube. For the most part, it's easier if you email me with your questions. If you go to my website, carrythemortician.com and go to coffee with Carrie, there is a simple link. You can put a question in there and it will send it to me. Super easy, super great to do. You can also go and sponsor a cup of coffee, which is my new fun thing um, that if you want to, I don't know, Send me a dollar to get a cup of coffee. I don't care. I don't I don't need the money for coffee. It's just kind of fun. Someone recommended it. So we'll give it a try. Who knows? Um, so here's the question. Do you have advice to us who are physically disabled and want to go into the funeral business? I don't know if you are disabled, but I have fibromyalgia and desperately been trying to find a disabled mortician to ask them how they manage their disability while also doing physically, emotionally, and mentally demanding work. If you know of anyone who could maybe answer this question, if you cannot yourself, I would love to speak with them if you're willing. I'm starting school in January and my disability is mostly managed, but I do get tired easily and it's difficult for me to stand for long periods of time. It's also difficult to lift very heavy objects. I hope there's a special place for me in death care. So <clears throat> I have done videos with um, a buddy named Tyler and he is in a wheelchair and is gung ho trying to get into this business and has worked at a funeral home. They have embraced him. They have helped him figure out how to maneuver and do what he can do best and try to figure out, you know, um, if he does want to go become an embalmer. Embalming is the one thing that we've, um, him and I have kind of talked over that how do we keep your chair clean if you're embalming? How do we um, get you high enough. We can do ramps. We can do, you know, there's things that you can do. Even I had a discussion last week with a woman who is a short little petite woman and felt challenged by being in the prep room because tables are sometimes taller and, 
you know, things are not as accommodating sometimes when you're not the average, I guess. And so, you know, people chiming in and giving her advice, get a stool, get what you need. It's going to take time to learn. Even when I first started dressing bodies, I was calling one of the funeral directors to come help me all the time. He finally said, figure it out, Carrie. And I was like, what did you just say? And I was really offended. But then I was like, you know what? I'm so thankful someone challenged me and someone made me learn because being left with a 300 pound deceased, trying to dress them by myself made me learn how to do it. I had to learn how to maneuver that body, learn how to roll them, learn how to do things. If we're not challenged, we can't learn. And we all have things that maybe hinder us some far more than others. My kids and I were talking about this 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 morning, actually, because they have some kids that are challenged in their um, classes. And so learning to work around some of that, not even around, but with it, um, I would say, depending what your needs are, it's being very vocal about them, figuring out you, where your comfort level is, what you want to do the most. You know, there's so many positions in this business. And this kind of goes along too with a woman that sent a question that, um, how do you get in this business in your forties? You know, like, what is it logical to go back to school? There are so many areas of this business you can work in. So many, so many, they don't require more choice school. Don't require going and, you know, doing the, that schooling and getting just that license. You can do pre-need, you can do aftercare, you can do arrangements in many states without being licensed. The only things like in Michigan that I have to be legally licensed for is embalming and overseeing the final disposition. So running the funeral and being at the graveside. Somebody else could run the funeral even as long as I'm at the graveside for the burial. That makes it legal. So there's all these other areas, graphics, um, department, doing all the printing, doing the videos, hair cosmetics, dressing bodies, getting them in the caskets, parking lots, removals, um, all sorts of things, working funerals, working visitations, all these areas that you can work in, you don't have to be licensed. So it's finding the parts that are where you connect to and where you can do the best. You don't have to stand for long periods of time if you're making arrangements. You don't have to lift anything if you're making arrangements. So maybe that's your zone. Maybe you handle phone calls. Maybe you do um, you know, things online where you're an online arranger for people that are remote. There's all sorts of things. It's all going to depend on the funeral home you work at. End of day. That is what is going to dictate your comfort, your happiness. It's just like any job. It depends on the employer and the, the location of where you work. It's not the job in general. So find what you love. If you've not worked in a funeral home, work in a funeral home first before you go to school. Find out what really happens at a funeral home. Find out what all the rules are, all the positions are. Find out that stuff before you go to school because you get into school, you learn it, you leave, and then you can't find your happiness within the funeral home because you didn't realize what the funeral home really was. I say it, I say it again. I'm going to say it, say it, say it. Go to work in a funeral home before you go to school to be a funeral director. Understand the job before you go to school to do something. That's my feeling. That's what I say. <laughs> How tall am I? That's an odd question. So I used to be five, nine and a half. I'm now down to like five, eight and a half. Shrunk. Shrunk. Women in my family shrink a lot. My grandma was like down to here by the time she died. She just, and my mom is now. So I'm afraid I'm going to too. <laughs> so oh, Matt, thank you. I'm disabled and worked in a funeral home. There's more than just preparing the bodies. I did video. Slides, music for services. Love it. Ray in Michigan. Hey, all in Michigan. Yeah, I had a gentleman that was a part-timer worked for me at the funeral home as well. Not for me, with me. It's a big, I hate that work for me. But um, he worked visitations and funerals and everything. He was in a wheelchair. And one of the first things I said to him is, meet me at the funeral home. We are going to go around the whole funeral home go through kind of what we would do during a visitation or a service. And you tell me where you feel like maybe you need something extra. 
because I don't know. I don't know what might be helpful. You know, if we keep the key to the door up above on the door ledge, it's not really accessible to somebody that's even shorter, let alone in a wheelchair. So we need to keep the key in a better location. That was simple. Um, one of the things that he found was carrying flowers. You know, after a funeral, after a visitation, you're setting up flowers. As they get delivered, you bring them in and set them up. Then afterwards, you're loading them out into the car. Well, he's happy to help. But if he puts a plant or like a vased flower on his lap and he's rolling, that water is sloshing. So he ended up with a really wet lap a few times. And we realized, okay, that doesn't really work. You care, you grab specific, you know, like plants. We'll grab the vased flowers. And it's just figuring out a flow that works for everybody. You know, maybe if you can't carry things, then you pack up the register. You help dismiss folks. You help in the parking lot get them to their cars and get flags on their cars if you do flags in, you know, your area. There's all these things. It's figuring out what works best as a team for all of your parts. People without what, you know, labeled as having a disability have strengths and weaknesses. It's the same with everybody. Just because you're disabled doesn't mean you have something that's not more of a strength than mine. So it's finding your strengths and using them. Announcement two. I don't think I've posted this everywhere. I need to start posting it more, but I'm going to be doing a meet and greet here in Michigan um, on March 18th. March 18th, be a crematory tour meet and greet. Worked well when we did that last time. This one's going to be up in Mount Pleasant um, at Daisy Hill Crematory uh, from two to four, just kind of an open house. You can stop in, but I am asking if you want to attend to RSVP so we get a good idea of how many people, so we can have enough people there helping to do the tours and um, show you around and stuff. So shoot me an email if you would like to attend March 18th in Mount Pleasant, Michigan, Daisy Hill Crematory. I've done videos with Steve there. Um, I think I've done two there now, maybe just one. I was there twice and uh, great guy, great location. It's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. They have glitter tile in the bathroom. I will never get over it. And if you come, I will show you the glitter tile in the bathroom. Super exciting. They're working right now on a, installing a pet retort as well and getting that all set up. So we'll see where that's at when it comes. But it's a great chance to um, meet me if you'd like to meet me in person, but to check out a crematory and just see the ins and outs. So there we go with that. Um, oh, Matt is in Australia. Yeah, that's a little far to come for a mean grief. Um, where is this part of Michigan? Um, Carrie, K-A-R-I. Let me type it in here for you. There you go. Um, just Dixie, you'll have to check out, you'll have to put it on MapQuest and see, um, what it is, but it'll be from two to four Eastern Standard Time. Do the funeral homes you work at feel homey? I think so. They're, I'm comfortable there. You know, some of them are super old school, still a little, you know, low ceilings, no windows in some of the rooms because they're old houses that have been built onto. So sometimes the chapel's in the middle, there's no windows, but then you, some of them are more contemporary built, big, tall ceilings, big windows, stained glass, beautiful. It just depends on which location I'm at. I freelance funeral direct. And so I work at several different funeral homes. Um, I met some the more than others, but, um, yes, I, you know, it just depends. I feel comfortable. I will walk into any of the funeral homes that I go to in the dark and just walk in you know, with very minimal outdoor light coming in and can maneuver through. I'm not scared at all. Totally comfortable. It's just, but that's my vantage point. Most people, I mean, like what I'm going to do a poll because I said I can do a poll. So, 
have you guys gone to a funeral home when you have not had a loss? Because I say most people have never entered a funeral home when they have not had somebody die. They've never walked into one. So without a heavy heart, without sorrow, sadness, going to pay respects to a friend that has had a loss, they've never entered a funeral home just as a building, go into there just because. And as a funeral director, when I go there every day, I haven't lost somebody entering that building. I'm going there to do a job, to care for people, and I don't have sorrow on me to go going there. That's a very different perspective than, you know, the majority of the population. So, hey, Brooke, yay! I love when people catch me live and they're excited about it. It's very humbling to me. Uh, what do I think of the big corporate funeral home chains like SCI? I get this question and I, I defend statements about some of this stuff because I have seen very badly run family owned funeral homes. I've seen very badly run corporate owned funeral homes. Just because it's corporate or family does not define if it is a good funeral home to work at. There is a lot of pros and cons on both. You know, family owned funeral homes, you're going to have some family dynamics that may not go well in your favor. Corporate, you have to deal with corporate stuff. That may not go well with your favor, but the benefits that may be provided from a corporate company, because there's a larger number of employees, can outshine sometimes what a family company is going to be able to offer you. At the end of the day, it all depends on the interaction with the people that are boots on the ground at that location, the managers, the other staff, how it is run, because that is who you have to interact with every day no matter who owns it. So there's pros and cons on both sides. I do not have a negative feeling towards SEI. I do not have a negative feeling about family run. I am try to be neutral in both, but I have seen both go badly and both go well. So hello, Gemma in Ireland. That's so exciting. Ooh. Oh, and then, yes, I had this other question. Um, transitioning into the field. And I think I kind of touched on that. I think that you have to not just go um, talk to a funeral home, but you really need to shadow. You need to um, work there for a while. I think that that's important. Hold on, guys. I'm going to, I'm noticing some stuff on the camera lens. Oh, I didn't make it better. I need to make it better. We used dignity from my child last month and had a good experience with them. See, and that's the thing. You can have a good or bad experience and then you can blame it on it being corporate or not. But you could have gone to a different location and had a bad experience with dignity or, a different, you know, vice versa. That's the thing. It's about the people that are there, not the ownership always. Sorry, guys, I got to hydrate. <laughs> oh, been making lists. So Josh and I, if you don't know who Josh is, um, my boyfriend, crematory operator. And uh, we've been making lists for our other channel, Ick Factor, like the top three cemeteries we want to visit, the top three haunted places we want to visit, the top three things on our bucket list. Maybe not top three, but some three things on our bucket list. And his son is going to join in too and do those. We've been coming up with those lists just to have fun. It's been kind of fun to think about three gra graves. We talked about specific like famous graves or whatever we want to go to. I don't, I'm not a cemetery goer unless it's really my job or I'm doing a video for you guys. I just don't connect to cemeteries for the person that's there. Unless there's like a really good story behind something and it's kind of interesting to go visit. I just don't connect in that way. I think because I disconnect from the bodies and stuff. And so it's like, huh, what famous people's graves do I want to go to? Like you guys, if someone said, what famous grave do you want to go to? What would be the first one that popped in your mind? Put it in the comments. Tell me who would be the famous because it took me some serious 
searching, looking, Googling, figuring out where I wanted to go. So my, my, I found this on the web. Oh, my phone or my watch is listening to me. Um, so it's been actually interesting to kind of dig into that. Elizabeth Taylor. See, those don't excite me. Like, you know, Michael Jackson, Elizabeth Taylor, some of those people that just doesn't do much for me. Um, which is weird. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Very interesting. Um, I had another email from someone and wanted to discuss it just a little bit with you guys. Um, it was from a teacher and she has a student who's, um, one of their parents died taking their own lives this last in the last few weeks and just said, you know, what are some ways we can support this student? What should we look out for? And um, she said, you know, share the information in a general way if you want on a video. So wanted to just kind of throw this out there too. Um, I encouraged her as I would anybody, do not look at the manner of death as being what you focus on, especially with a child. It, it, it doesn't matter how they lost their parent. They lost a parent. End of story. We kind of put greater focus on some manners of death. And we turn them into little victims almost if their parent died in certain ways. And we can't do that. Like they are, they're a child. They had a loss. You got to kind of ride the ebb and flow with them. Just ride it because kids do not feel like they don't, they don't wait death like we do. It goes in bigger ebbs and flows. Like, oh my gosh, I dropped my fruit snack on the floor. My mom died. These, there's not magnitude to the death as it is so much. Not a psychologist here at all. Just observations of many, many, many years of, of seeing children and, and as such. Um, so just supporting them where they're at, going to the visitation, being present for them. Um, I had a friend that asked about a child, you know, she's going to go visitation for a kid that was in her class. And I said, bring a special stuffed animal. Like it's a comfort to have something, even as adults, it's a comfort for us to hold something. Think about going to the bar and standing with nothing in your hand, even a glass of water. Do you feel it? Do you feel what that, it's like this weird discomfort. As soon as you put a glass of water in somebody's hand, whew, it's weird. We, I watched this at visitation, it was at a funeral home that had visitation and they had out um, snacks and drinks. Like you could do lemonade or water and Chex Mix or something. People, as soon as they got a bottle of water or a cup of like lemonade or something in their hands, whew, it was like this ease. It's the weirdest social experiment to watch. And I'm talking hundreds of visitation that I watched this at, at this funeral home, that people were kind of quiet, almost a little off put. And as soon as you put something in their hand, whoo, they were like talking and much more casual. Same with kids. Kids, kids need to have something. It helps us feel, it helps them feel a comfort level. So I just encourage that. And they also ask, you know, what if this child pops out with a question in class? And that's a thing. It could be six months down the road. You're sitting at dinner with a kid and this kid pops out like. So is there really a study under the ground at the cemetery where everybody's living down there? Out of the blue, out of the literal blue, this is something somebody has told me their child said to them after a grandparent was buried six months previous. Kids' minds don't categorize the way we do. So they could be like, so why is the sky blue? Now, does a dead body really move after they're dead? Like, they just throw out questions. These comment no rational. It's like a ping, pinball machine, you know? And so if a child says something inappropriate, and this was my advice to her. Again, not a psychologist, just here's my opinion. Um, just like any other child saying something that's, not on point, you know, like my dad watches porn a lot or why does my mom have so many boyfriends? Like kids just blurt 
And so if it's, they say something about mom's or dad dying or somebody dying, you know, teachers can know how to respond, hopefully, well to these questions anyway, and saying, that's a good question, but I think that's one we're going to answer one-on-one -on -one later. Is that okay? And move on to something else. Don't push aside their question or make them feel like it is inappropriate, but letting them know we're going to get to that later alone time <laughs> sort of thing. And they may forget it or they may come back around and say, hey, can we have that one on one time? So just, you know, dealing with some of that. I want cake at my funeral. Cake is good. I like cake. Yellow cake, chocolate frosting. It's my jam right there. Go into the Paris catacombs, King Tut in Cairo, even though it was empty at that time. So a lot of musicians. Yeah, as you can guess, Josh, if you watch anything with Josh, Josh is a, I don't know, what do you say, metalhead, like loves rock music and stuff. So some of his is, yeah, we got hunting and rock metal. That's going to dictate some of his. <laughs> Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. I got to lay the wreath at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier um, when I was in high school. And it's quite amazing that those soldiers do that routine and over and over and over all the time, all the time. Like it's amazing to me. <coughs> Muhammad Ali, Chapel at Windsor Castle. That's fascinating too. This type O negative. Oh my gosh. I've never heard of that. Tina, thank you for that. Yes, there's a lot of mental health professionals that give their inputs. But just like, just because you're a clergy doesn't mean you're going to preach a good funeral. Just because you're a mental health professional doesn't know, mean you know grief and you know all of that. So asking people who deal with grieving families 24 seven is a great question. It's a great thing to ask people because our input on death and response and all of that is super valid. Just because we're not mental health professionals doesn't mean that a mental health professional is going to know better than we would in some situations. So I think getting opinions and then making your own choices, how you deal in your own classroom is great. She's seeking out advice because she wants more input. There's obviously going to be social workers and grief response people. And I've seen how badly some of them can do their jobs too. There's a lot of amazing ones, but there's also some bad ones, just like bad funeral directors, bad everybody. There's bad people in all professions. There's a lot of amazing ones, but getting more in, input than less is always good to do. I'm a criminal justice major and a couple years of forensic science. What education do I need to pursue a mortuary career? This is a great question. You would think that all that would be greatly applicable. No, you might have a few classes that transfer into. So the thing with mortuary science is the variety of classes you have to take. Public speaking, accounting, um, psychology, social work, uh, um, anatomy, chemistry, biology, like all these areas. And you have to take so many credits in all of these areas. I think there's like 15 different areas you have to get different credits in before then you start your more choice science degree. So the best thing to do is take your class list, go to a school that you want to attend and say, hey, what's going to transfer over? What do I still need to get? Um, I had to get a statistics class that I was lacking. Your state also is going to dictate what classes you have to have certain um, curriculum in too. So it's going to depend on your state and the schooling. But like I have a bachelor's degree in, my, in psychology and that allowed me to do a shorter apprenticeship 
in Michigan. I only had to do six months instead of a year. So that did help with that. And then um, a lot of classes from school transferred over in the social sciences. However, um, I knew going into uh, after my junior year that I was going to go to mortuary school for this after my bachelor's degree in psychology. And so I started taking random classes along with my psychology curriculum. I would start taking accounting and a public speaking class and uh, I took a statistics class over the summer. So I started taking some of those. So I never had to do classes, the pre-classes when I went to mortuary school because I had done them all beforehand. And then I got to opt out of some of the mortuary science classes because I had already taken them like the intro classes, I'd already taken them in my first bachelor's study. Ray says, back in October, my best friend and I lost one of our classmates. She still doesn't really want to talk about it. What can I do, say, to open up a healthy conversation? you can't force it. You know, you, if you feel you need to talk about it, then by all means say, you know, because we both really cared for this classmate, can I, can I talk to you about this? And if this is your friend, she will talk with you. Enter it as you wanting to talk, not that you're wanting to make her talk. And you wanting to talk might open her up for talking, but People do things in different ways. Maybe this is her way of dealing is not talking or where you, maybe you want to talk. Um, it's it's going to be different for everybody. Gemma, there's a documentary on Netflix you could watch. Ooh, who are you, re who are you responding to and what documentary is it? Carrie, is it harder to work on a child than it is a teenager, an adult, or an elderly person? Kind of, you may emotionally harder. Um, not always. It just depends on the scenario. It depends on the situation. Sometimes children are at peace from maybe a rough life or something, and I'm getting to care for them in their their last moments and and give them as much love as I can in that time. And that is the blessing I get to give. I can't focus on the death. I have to focus on what my job is at the moment or else I get wrapped up in the emotions of it and then I'm no good to know anybody. Um, so there's definitely moments that are harder with children, especially as a mom now. Uh, that changed a lot. I can't let my mind go there. I have to stop my mind from putting myself in any what if scenario when I'm working, but definitely, I don't know. There's, there's moments with every age, every age teenagers bother me probably more than, than a lot. Um, just because they are full on beginning their life. They are into life and they're just on that cusp of beginning the next step. And especially if it's a suicide or something, it's like, gosh, if you just knew what could come next, if you just had known this relationship was not the only one you'd ever have, or that you will find more happiness, you would have found more happiness past. That's always hard. Uh, those, those, that always is harder, I think. Um, Stephanie, on the psychology classes that are required, sometimes it's just simply psychology. You have to go to do this psychology or social psychology or whatever. So you're, you'll have to check with your state on it. Um, am I going to do interviews this year? What kind of interviews are you thinking, Jeremy? Does social security pay for senior disability death benefits? No. They do not. The only benefit from Social Security is a $255 death benefit to a surviving spouse that comes, you know, weeks after everything is done. Um, that is the only thing Social Security gives money for. And it's a one time only for the surviving spouse.
Oh yeah. You, so like interviewing some crematory operators and stuff. Yes, I will be. Um, definitely. I have actually, you guys have requested one interview so many times and I will be interviewing her later this month. Anybody want to guess who it is? I'm going to give you guys a minute. You guys have sent me this request the most in the last few months of interviewing this woman. Give a guess. Give a guess. Whoever posts the answer first, I don't know what you get. It's a round of applause. I, <laughs> but um, yeah, we, Kate, who's Kate? Should I know who Kate is? Oh, Caitlin. Um, no, I've interviewed Caitlin. I've done several videos with Caitlin. <laughs> Josh, the crematory operator. Yeah, you guys will always see Josh. Um, he'll pop on live videos with me. He has so much knowledge about crematories and but more so even burial vaults. He did burial vault installation and, and everything for 27 years. Like that's he is a wealth of knowledge. When you get him talking about that, he is in his zone total zone. And it's amazing. Okay. Let's say this is a TikToker, a TikToker, a very well-known TikTok person, not a funeral director that you guys have wanted me to interview. Um, I also have lined up. We're going to be doing some beer with the boys coming up. Um, more of the murders at the funeral homes. I did not know you guys would like those videos so much. I had no concept that that would be a series, but I've got three of that, more of them recorded. So I'll be dropping those once in a while. <clears throat> I also have a new series coming. I think you guys will love. I'm going to be, I think, posting it as a podcast and as a vlog here on YouTube. Um, and try out both mediums and see where I get response on it. But um, you mean like Josh working at the crematory or doing the vault? Um, no, we won't show things that have um, deceased in them. And so we I won't ever really show the process of cremation unless I get somebody that's like, Carrie, I want you to show my body when I die and then they die and then we show it or something. But um, man, you guys have requested this so much. I'm quite surprised. So hospice nurse, Julie, she is a big TikToker. Um, people love her, love her. So I know, man, it's kind of surprising because I have had this request so many times. I do not know graveyard gal. Um, Carol's asking, how are you doing, Carrie? I wanted to know why they're going to do an autopsy on my sister because she died from suicide. Um, Carol, I'll need to know a lot more about this scenario. So in the counties that I work in, it just depends on the investigator if they require an autopsy or not, if it seems to be suicide. Sometimes they want to check, especially if it's a, a drug overdose, they need to look at how much is in her system and they need to do toxicology. An autopsy does not always mean a Y incision in a cranial incision. It could be just a uh, look at the outside of their body or draw blood, something like that. That is also an autopsy. So it just depends what kind of an autopsy and why. Um, why? Ray, that's a great question. Since you're from Michigan too, have you checked out the Anatomy of Death Museum in Mount Clemens? So um, I should be at the museum right about now. That was where I was going today, was the Anatomy of Death Museum, because um, Todd has expanded it quite a bit. And so I was supposed to go back and do video again, but <clears throat> I've been up a lot of the night just hacking. <laughs> Didn't want to spread this heck cold to him today. Um, feeling a lot better today than I was the last couple days. So it's on its way out, but I didn't want to spread it to him. 
today, um, but I was supposed to be there. I do have a video on it. I did a couple years ago from visiting there and had a lot of two minute videos from there. So he's actually going to be on my new podcast blog as well. And we were going to record that episode. So we had a lot of recording we were going to do today. Unfortunately, uh, needed to just chill today. Sometimes, sometimes life tells us to sit down <laughs> and just stop. And it's hard for me to do that because I just say yes and I take on things and I'm okay, 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 and just take it on. And um, found that I needed to just take a minute for me today. And I'm doing work, obviously. I've got a bunch of scripts I'm writing for upcoming two minutes and stuff, two minute videos and things. Um, but definitely needed to just chill. Probably going to take a nap later. <laughs> just let my body um, rest up here because I have a busy, busy next couple weeks coming too. Yeah. So Leo, I am shocked you're the first person that I'm seeing post this. The two cases where funeral homes receive people who are still alive in the last week and a half-ish. The first was in Iowa and then the second was just happened in New York, I think. Um, the first one, I believe it was a from a nursing home, a hospice patient. So it was a hospice death, a hospice nurse pronounced, and then the deceased went to the funeral home and they found that I think it was a she still alive at the funeral home. I've not read a lot on the second one that has happened, um, but yeah, it can happen. It's not very common. It's super weird that it's happened twice in the last week. Um, I question like what medication people were on. Is there a specific medication that could cause this type of reaction from a body that is lowering all of their, you know, things so much that they are in fact appearing dead or is creating some kind of a arrhythmia that I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I'm just like, you know, you go through not just, oh, that person was stupid. What more is there to it? If this has happened twice in the last week, what more is there to these stories? What else is going on there? Because I don't just chalk it up to, oh, somebody's stupid. I think that's terrible. So let's, I'm interested to see what comes out of it. So And it's weird that they put them in body bags. Like nobody around in anywhere around me puts people in body bags unless they're at a hospital or coming from the medical examiner. We don't use body bags as a funeral home. We go to the nursing home. They're placed on a cot in a, a pouch. And I think that the this is a media thing is what I, that's my first response is this is a media thing calling something a body bag that they're not really in a body bag. So a lot of cots, the way it works is the whole, the pouch that goes over instead of like a blanket that goes over them on the outside, the whole pouch comes up and around and zips. And then there's buckles that go around the person. I think they're calling that a body bag, that they're not really just in a body bag. I don't know. I question that because I don't know what funeral home, I'm sure there's some, but that's a high cost that you are using a body bag every time you go get a person. It just seems an extreme thing that most funeral homes don't use. So I question that they were in an actual body bag. Sorry guys, but the nose is dripping. Oh. Oh, goodness. <laughs> yeah. So let's see how our poll's doing. So you guys are about 50-50 that some of you have gone to funeral homes when you've not had a loss and some have not. Um, Carrie, because just put a blanket, it's not the, the blanket's not pushed in on their face. It's just laying over. So just lay down, lay a blanket over your face. Can you still breathe? Yeah, it's a little restricted, but if their face is just to the side a little bit or not, sometimes there's a liner on the inside of that. So it's not like a fabric. 
it's a plastic um, liner or a rubber liner sometimes. And so it's, it's not going to sit creased in on the face. It's just going to sit around the face. So there's lots of breathing room, lots of breathing room. Mm. Well, thank you guys. I'm going to log off. I think go do some scripts for, um, is that wash and reuse. Yes. If it's just the pouch that's used on everybody, um, that is used on that cot. So, uh, they're reused. They can be washed. They can be wiped down, but body bags are not reused traditionally. So I don't, that's why I don't think that they're probably using body bags on these bodies. If they're coming from a nursing home or a, a hospice from the home or something, we would never use body bags. I don't know anybody that uses body bags like that. Any of the removal services I know, funeral homes I know, I don't know anybody who does. I'm sure they're out there. I'm sure somebody can show me one, but that is not traditionally how it would be. And it cost effective would be not a cost effective thing to do. So, well, thank you guys. If you want to attend the meet and greet, like I said, I will not have a stocking cap on that day, <laughs> but you do need to email me, Carrie at Carrie the mortician.com. Um, and send me questions if you'd like me to ask, answer things in the next video. Thanks guys.